Good morning. This morning we're continuing with our exploration of the different styles or literary styles that we find within scripture. Today it's inquiry style uh, of stories at, that stories where folks bring questions to Jesus. Um, we're going to hear from the Gospel of Matthew, the 22nd chapter, verses 15 through 40. So I invite you now to listen for the living word of God. Then the Pharisees went and plotted to entrap Jesus in what he said. So they sent their disciples to him, along with the Herodians, saying, Teacher, we know that you are sincere, and teach the way of God in accordance with truth, and show deference to no one, for you do not regard people with partiality. Tell us then what you think. Is it lawful to pay taxes to the emperor or not? But Jesus, aware of their malice, said, Why are you putting me to the test, you hypocrites? Show me the coin used for taxes. And they brought him a denarius. Then he said to them, Whose head is on this? Whose head is this? And whose title? And they answered, The emperor's. Then he said to them, Give, therefore, to the emperor the things that are the emperor's, and to God the things that are God's. When they heard this, they were amazed, and they left him and went away. The same day, some Sadducees came to Jesus, saying, There is no resurrection. And they asked him a question, saying, Teacher, Moses said, If a man dies childless, his brother shall marry the widow and raise up children for his brother. Now there were seven brothers among us. The first married and died childless, leaving the widow to his brother. The second did the same, so also the third, down to the seventh. Last of all, the woman herself died. In the resurrection, then, whose wife of the seven will she be? For all of them had married her. Jesus answered them, You're wrong, because you know neither the scriptures nor the power of God. For in the resurrection, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels in heaven. And as for the resurrection of the dead, have you not read what was said to you by God? I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He is God not of the dead, but of the living. And when the crowd heard it, they were astounded at his teaching. When the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together, and one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him. Teacher, which commandment in the law is the greatest? He said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. The Spirit of God has been present in the reading and hearing of these words. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Questions. So I have to say I have family in. I haven't seen them for a couple years. Like many of you, we're still doing those reunion things. My uh, one niece is going to come to Music Factory tomorrow and throughout the week, so I'm excited. Her brother, who's a little bit younger, isn't quite old enough for Music Factory, but he is an inquisitive little kid. I'd like to say he's inquisitive not with words, but with hands. We all ask questions in different ways. My great nephew Liam leads with his hands, while others of us may lead with our words. Questions are part of life. They take all kinds of forms. They're the closed-ended ones, you know, the yes and no type questions. And then there are those multiple choice, and the ranking ones, the ones we're now more accustomed to, at least the adults in the room, accustomed to taking every time a certain phone carrier we might use wants our opinion. There's the comparing questions or the scaling questions. Good, fair, excellent. How likely on a scale? Sound familiar to anyone? The odds are during the week you have taken some sort of survey question thing, if you think about it. Then there's the leading questions. I love these questions. I was talking, John, I'm gonna, uh, I didn't ask if I could, I've already singled them out. 
We were talking earlier before the 8 o'clock service uh, about the two different styles of approach when a lawyer steps in a courtroom. And I asked him what his favorite approach was, and he told me the direct, right? He likes ended questions. Okay, that's when, uh, you know, so tell, me a li tell us about the experience, and you just let somebody rattle on for a little while. I, on the other hand, and you might want to pray for me, I like cross-examination. So you were at church, yes. It was Sunday, yes. You were singing the first hymn, yes. It was familiar to you, yes. That's my style. And eventually, if you ever see someone who's really, really good at cross-examination, they can get someone to sell their soul and the person won't even know they've sold it. That's why you need to pray for me. <laughs> My goal is not to have anybody lose their soul today, I hope. <laughs> God help us. The questions that we choose are often driven, or the style of question, driven by the purpose. This week, this became very clear to me as I've been watching the Olympics. Anybody else watching the Olympics? Okay, so after every single swim meet, there was a very quick press conference. Did you notice? And the swimmers are standing there going, yes, <laughs> thanks, grateful, so go, cool. yeah. And I, my mind was like, you know, why? We seem to have an insatiable desire for information and for entertainment, and we use our news agencies to do that. The problem with such an approach from my perspective, and this is my faith eyes looking at this, is that such interviews really aren't about the athletes, are they? In the case of swimming, they've had very little time to recover. In other recent cases, like at Wimbledon, right after matches, they expect someone who has just been severely disappointed with something to be able to sit there and, and answer a question that will please those who are watching or that will give a sound bite. I don't know, friends. Such interviews to me do not speak of love of neighbor. They don't speak of care and concern. They don't send a message other than, you know, you're not more than a sound bite to us. Questions. There's something about timing of them, right? And there is a, an important part to timing. The world says more, more, more. And Jesus says, take time, rest. In Scripture, some of our more familiar texts where we will have heard questions being asked of God come in the Psalms. And you can Google any number of these. I particularly chose a Psalm that reflects the outpouring of a person's heart in a time of trouble for some of the types of questions that we might raise to God. The Psalmist did, Psalm 13, verses one through two. How long, Lord, would you forget me forever? Ever been there? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I wrestle with my thoughts and day after day have sorrow in my heart? How long will my enemy triumph over me? Questions born of life's condition, taking them to God, trying to understand. See, that's what theology is. It's just faith seeking understanding. And when we're seeking understanding, we ask questions. There are other times we ask questions in faith, though, also. The times when we're living in awe of the wonders of God. Psalm 8 is probably the best example of this. You probably know it quite well. When I consider your heavens, the works of your fingers, the moon and the stars, which you have set in place, what is mankind that you are mindful of them, human beings that you care for them? A question spoken from a heart filled with awe at the wonders of God. A question that shows a humble soul. A question that realizes, that comes from a heart that realizes their place in all of creation and why they have it and from whom they received it. There are other places in Scripture. Job, there are lots of questions in the book of Job. 
a book that challenges us to consider what are we trying to preserve about God in such times of suffering. And then there's a prophet you might not be so familiar with, Habakkuk. Gosh, I hope I said that right. Let me spell it, H-A-B-A-K-K-U-K, for those who would like to take a look. You'll find this particular prophet in a portion of our scriptures that are called the Minor Prophets. Here's something important about the Minor Prophets, and it upholds a Jewish tradition, this understanding about the Minor Prophets. Is it not that their writings were of lesser value, just that they have a short book? (laughs) So if you're looking for short books to read, go to the Minor Prophets. You're looking for short uh, New Testament books to read? Go to the epistles after, say, Colossians, or work your way backwards. They're much shorter. They're in length order in the New Testament, longest to shortest. Habakkuk was a minor prophet. He, the book itself is a report of a vision, and it is from a time close to the Babylonian Empire. The primary faith-seeking understanding situation within it The reason for the questions is it's a time when the people are living under injustice and the questions that are being asked are about what do we do when we're in a situation where we're living in an unjust time and place. These words from Habakkuk. How long, Lord, must I call for help, but you do not listen? Or cry out to you violence, but you do not save? Why do you make me look at injustice? Why do you tolerate wrongdoing? Destruction and violence are before me. There is strife and conflict abounds. Therefore, the law is paralyzed and justice never prevails. The wicked hymn and the righteous so that justice is perverted. The words of someone who truly knows what it means to experience injustice in their own time. God's reply in this particular, to this particular set of questions is keep your eyes out because I'm about to do something unbelievable. To questions, questions of the heart, God responds with words of hope. Today's inquiry stories, though, are a little bit different than what I've just described to you. These stories, they're focused on Jesus' answer, aren't, these questions aren't meant to give words of praise to God or to demonstrate a struggle, a true faith struggle. Instead, these questions are meant to entrap. Have you ever met someone like this or been somewhere in a place where someone stands during a Q&A time to give actually their opinion masked as a question? <laughs> happens a lot in, in, at, at times, especially when we're dealing with justice issues, unfortunately. The questions that we hear today aren't questions that are meant to connect truly and reach out to God. They're instead meant to challenge Jesus, set him up, test him. The one about taxes is tied to understandings of idolatry in that day and age, the image of Caesar on a coin. And Jesus says to the people, give to Caesar what is Caesar's, give to God what is God's, and then leaves us to figure out which is which. Thank you, Jesus. In the process, he does answer yes to the question, paying taxes is is not against the Torah. But from that exchange, we learn that there are things in this world that aren't of God. They're of human making. But all of creation is of God. The other story we heard is probably one that may have been pretty familiar. It's that wife one. I get this one a lot, by the way, when I'm interacting with people who don't necessarily um, connect with church as a way to say, hey, you know, this whole God thing isn't real. The one about the wife and the wife and the husband dies, wife dies, husband, and then the wife eventually this question about resurrection. You know, the first group used flattery to try to get Jesus. This group is trying 
to get him to acknowledge that there's no such thing as resurrection. Jesus answers them, you know, you have two misunderstandings. Don't you just love it when someone says you don't get it? Oh, by the way, you don't get it in two ways. <laughs> the first being that you don't understand about the power of God. And the second is the lens through which you're interpreting scripture is not a helpful lens for you. We're asked with this portion of the text to understand that it carries the assumption that eternal life is neither a mere extension of earthly life nor a total voiding of life in this world. There's something unimaginable, some form of unimaginable transformation thanks to the power of God that happens with eternal life. And no, we don't get it, but it's there. The patriarchs, we are told, the patriarchs were told, may be in the grave, but they're still living, and we're meant to sit with that mystery. God's faithfulness and power is the grounding for the hope for life beyond the grave, we're told in that portion of this question and answer text. That's probably the most important piece of this day. If you take away nothing else from this morning, God's faithfulness and power is the grounding for hope for life beyond the grave. Yes, there's resurrection. We're learning about it today from the one who knew what it meant to experience injustice, suffer, and die. And then the third story. The third story is one I think we all like to quote the most, especially when we're trying to say, we're okay, God. We're okay with God. It's the one that tells us to love God fully with our being and to love our neighbors as ourselves. The trick in this third story, remember the trick in the first had to do with idolatry. The second was, hey, we're trying to get you to agree that there isn't something that Indeed, there already is. And this one, the trick is trying to get Jesus to prioritize one law over another. Do you know anyone who does that? I would wager a bet that each and every one of us, please forgive me. You don't have anything to throw, right? Each and every one of us at some point in time has said about Scripture, this is the most important verse in Scripture. This is the most important rule for us to follow. The folks who were asking Jesus this question were trying to get him to lift one part of the law, the law of Moses, up over another part, which would have been blasphemy. So what Jesus does, instead of directly answering the question, is gives them an interpretive lens with which to look through, and that being the lens of love. When we're looking at the teachings in Scripture, all things being equal, the lens we're told to look with is a lens of love of God, love of neighbor, and love of self. If it fails the where is the love question, we might not be interpreting it correctly. So, we are inquisitive beings. We learn this way. We grow this way. Some of us ask questions with words. Others of us explore with our hands. When it comes to theology, we use our inquisitive natures to figure out how the questions we might have in this life match up with what our understanding is of God. Drawing on scripture, drawing on our ability to reason, Drawing on the traditions of the church, and here I don't just mean the local church, I mean the United Methodist Church, and then all of the Protestant churches, and then the Roman Catholic Church, and the Eastern Orthodox, all of Christian tradition. Wesley did that. And we use all of those to ask questions along the way, to ask God who, what, why, where, when, how, Wherever we might be, maybe a question that leads us to praise, maybe a question that helps us through troubling times. All meant to help us grow in faith, to move from doubt to total trust in God. 
So keep asking questions. Trust that God is always acting in unbelievable ways. Give thanks and praise to God. That God can handle our questions. Amen? Amen. Let us pray. Oh, we give you thanks and praise, Lord, that you have put inquisitive spirits within us. That when we look at the world and something seems out of whack with what we understand are your ways, are your teachings, are what you expect of us, are in line with how you love us and we're meant to love others, that we can freely come to you and go, what's up, Lord? This doesn't make sense. As we question and bring our questions to you, as our faith seeks to understand the world around us and you, we say thank you for your patience with us. May you find with us, within us humble spirits, not ones geared to prove how right we are, but instead spirits open to hear, spirits with eyes to see that new and wondrous thing you are doing. We left up to you as well those who are suffering this day, whose questions may be more akin with those of Job. And those who are experiencing injustice, whose questions may be more of that of Habakkuk. For we know, Lord, you are doing something new. May we join you through the power of your spirit. For you are a God who is faithful, slow to anger, and steadfast in love. Let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen.